In 2014, Netflix released its first original anime on its platform, Knights of Sidonia. The anime obsession existed in the States long before the 2000s, with access to the Pokemon franchise, Sailor Moon, and films like Kiki's Delivery Service. But the rise of social media and streaming services really pushed anime into the mainstream over the last 20 years. According to the Animeasure Syndicated Tracking and Segmentation Study, anime saw massive, market-leading growth in 2020 and continued to grow into 2022. This U.S. growth in anime viewership caused global revenues to eclipse Japanese domestic anime revenues for the first time in 2020. That is a lot of anime. The addition of anime-specific streaming sites such as Crunchyroll and Funimation have amassed hundreds of shows and movies in this genre to add to the ever-growing obsession here in the U.S. So what is anime exactly? Anime is a style of animation originating in Japanese films. The earliest commercial Japanese animation dates back to 1917, and Japanese anime production has since continued to increase steadily. Early anime films were intended primarily for the Japanese market, and as such, employed many cultural references unique to Japan. For example, the large eyes of anime characters are commonly perceived in Japan as multifaceted windows to the soul. Much of the genre is aimed at children, but anime films are sometimes marked by adult themes and subject matter. Modern anime began in 1956 and found lasting success in 1961 with the establishment of Mushi Productions by Osamu Tetsuka, a leading figure in modern manga, the dense, novelistic Japanese comic book style that contributed greatly to the aesthetic of anime. Anime such as Miyazaki Hao's Princess Mononoke in 1997 are the modern equivalent of the epic folk adventures once filmed by Japanese masters such as Mitsuguchi Kenji and Kurosawa Akira. At the turn of the 21st century, anime began to attain widespread international popularity with the Pokemon television series and films such as Miyazaki's Spirited Away, winner of an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature Film. Following anime's rise in popularity, anime conventions also escalated in the States. More than 140 large conventions are held at convention centers, colleges, and hotels across the country annually. One of the most popular events is the Anime Expo, which is held in Los Angeles and amounts to over 100,000 attendees each year. Their main purpose is to hold a panel with popular animators and artists, either discussing plots of popular shows or partaking in interviews with fans. So why anime? Well, if the rise in streaming platforms and social media made anime more accessible worldwide, what exactly is it about this style of animation that draws fans to consume so much of it? There are a bunch of reasons to love any particular genre of media, and anime is no different. A few of the main reasons global viewers keep coming back to binge time and time again are due to complex storylines, thoughtful character development, the use of strong female-identifying characters in leading roles, and continuous representation for the queer community. Anime allows more vibrancy and diversity in its characters more than most commercial animations. People in anime have dynamic personalities with real conflict and emotional stories woven into a narrative. In other words, it's not just a one-off emotional episode to make you cry over a dead dog. Sorry, Futurama. Love you. The characters are created with dreams, relationships, and ambitions, even within the wide variance in what they are. Ghosts, detectives, demons, students, warriors, hunters, aliens, and creature trainers. The list goes on. And there's no limit to what or who a character may be. For this reason, it makes sense that the queer community has always gravitated towards anime. And why wouldn't they? Seeing yourself portrayed in a character is one thing, but when the possibilities are virtually endless for the potential of what you can be and who you can love without fear, well, it's too good to pass up. If you're new to the world of anime or a casual viewer of the westernized programming of popular anime, you may be thinking, what queer characters are you even talking about? And you also wouldn't be wrong. Just because we know a character to be canonically LGBTQ+, doesn't mean it was presented that way in the edited English dub. Alas, anime, like most of its animated counterparts, has been subjected to sweeping censorship for English audiences for the last few decades. We've discussed the role of censorship in animation that's plagued the United States for the last mm, 100 years at length. The abridged version goes a little like this. During the 1920s, the motion picture industry in the United States changed drastically by the implementation of the Motion Picture Production Code, or the Hayes Code. Religious leaders banded together to form local censorship boards that included all media programming that was then enforced by ex-Postmaster General Will Hayes. After resigning from his post in President Harding's cabinet in 1922 due to scandal, of course, he became the first chairman of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America. His goal? To quote, clean up the pictures. 
thanks to his conservative credentials, including his roles as a Presbyterian deacon and chairman of the Republican Party. The public image of Hollywood at this time, however, had started to take a turn with prohibition and profound social changes. Drug and sex scandals about movie stars were featured frequently in popular newspapers, and film directors and producers were beginning to test the limits of what could be shown on screen. Pushing these boundaries prompted more calls to make censorship official. To meet the demand for decent programming, Hollywood studios banded together under Will Hayes to formally introduce the Production Code Administration, or PCA, in the 1930s. The Hayes Code, written by a Jesuit priest and Catholic publisher, and no, that's not the beginning of a bad joke, was designed as a, quote, code regulating the moral content of feature films, designed so that Hollywood could police itself and thus avoid or minimize outside censorship. It began as, advisory at first, sure, but quickly became more obligatory thanks to outside pressures. This code required all film producers and distributors to submit their scripts in advance of production for censorship by the MPPDA, and to submit their films for code approval before release. Without this approval, their films would not be released, or they were forced to pay expensive fines. The Hayes Code was vanquished like a demon at the hands of Tanjiro Kamado in the 1950s, and phased out entirely by the 1960s. But censorship of queerness still persisted. Several U.S. states adopted no-promo-homo laws, which prohibit or almost entirely limit the mention or discussion of homosexuality and transgender identity in public schools. In theory, these laws should explicitly apply to sex education courses, but they can also be applied to other parts of the school curriculum, as well as to extracurricular activities and groups such as gay-straight alliances. These explicit anti-LGBT curriculum laws can be found in six U.S. states, namely Florida, I'm so disappointed in you, Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Texas. Five other states, Montana, Arizona, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Florida, require parental notification of instruction on LGBTQ issues and allows parents to opt out of such instruction. The U.S. has always had a complicated history with the queer community and its prolific use of anti-gay legislation, rhetoric, and unspoken rules for media. In the world of animation, which was almost predominantly created for children, the censorship of queer and gender-bending or non-binary identities was a way to appease their parent voter base by not stepping on any toes. With anime, censorship had a new frontier to navigate. How do networks navigate a Japanese-made cartoon with queer relationships? Well. Easy. You dub it in English and rewrite it entirely, even if it doesn't make any sense to the plot. Yep. That's it. We've discussed at length on this channel about the animation boom of the 90s in the US, and one of the major contributors was the addition of Sailor Moon to our screens. The show had been adapted from Japanese and translated to English by DIC Entertainment, and premiered in North America in 1995 on Fox, WB, UPN, and later syndicated on Cartoon Network. While Sailor Moon wasn't the first anime in America, it was perhaps the most widely accessible, and definitely threw the genre into the mainstream. Before it was a beloved show, Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon was originally created as a manga illustrated by Naoko Taguchi. The series revolves around five teenage girl soldiers who, in a previous life, were members of the ancient Moon Kingdom's Silver Millennium. You know, casually. These magical warriors were destined to save Earth from the forces of evil in between regular teenage girl things, like doing homework and falling in love. After reaching popularity in Japan in the earlier half of the 1990s, Sailor Moon was broadcasted in Spain, France, South Korea, the Philippines, Poland, Peru, Brazil, and Sweden before eventually reaching the United States in 95. From its origins as a manga to the international lexicon, Sailor Moon underwent many changes to appease international audiences. The targeted age group for Sailor Moon, the manga, was young adults, 18 to 24, while the show was repurposed to appeal to young girls in the 13 to 18 age range. While that may not seem like a massive jump in age gaps, it created major obstacles in the dubbing process to make the show age appropriate, which inevitably resulted in the censorship of LGBT characters. Talking about censorship in anime is a particularly hard pill to swallow. Unlike American cartoons throughout the Hays Code years where the conflicts of what was deemed moral were splattered across race, gender, crime, and sexual explicitness, this era seems to be entirely about the subjectivity around the social and cultural appropriateness of sexuality and gender. Meaning, the censorship of anime seemed exclusively to exist to wipe out LGBTQ representation and non-conforming ideas of gender binary at the time. For Sailor Moon in particular, many countries, and especially the United States, chose to conceal gender-bending characters and water down the sexuality of the Sailor Scouts, if not alter it entirely. And yes, we're about to get into the cousin thing. Don't worry. 
The thing about censorship in anime that really bothered English viewers and continues to do so to this day is that the story and plot of most anime is incredibly complex and integral to the character's development. Not that most shows aren't, but with anime, that idea of anything being possible is really at stake here. When they chose to make a decision to change a plot for the sake of erasing queer characters, it really changed the original intended plot for the show. In Sailor Moon, there were two characters, Zoisite and Fisheye, who were originally written in the Japanese anime as gay men with feminine features, but were portrayed as just women in the English dubbed version to normalize their romantic relationships with other men. Okay, sure, fine, whatever. However, later episodes weren't ever dubbed in English due to new characters' abilities to change genders and question the normalcy of romance. If anyone was interested in continuing the storyline of these two characters, by the way, I hope you had a great Japanese teacher. The biggest and most egregious alteration from the censors was with Sailor Uranus's portrayal in Season 3 of the English dubbed version of Sailor Moon S. Buckle up those seatbelts because this one gets a little… odd. Sailor Uranus, or Amara in the English dubbed version, is a cisgendered female in the Japanese series and the manga that inspired it. She also has masculine features and doesn't conform to the stereotypical binary roles of the other female Sailor Scouts. In the manga, the Scouts actively question Amara's gender for the audience. When Serena, Sailor Moon, questions Amara's gender, Amara responds, Man, woman, why should something like that matter? In another chapter of the manga, Sailor Neptune, Michelle on the English dub, states that Sailor Uranus possesses both genders, and Amara frequently moves freely between both genders identifying as a woman but questioning the importance of gender and sexual identity. The idea of shattering the gender binary so cavalier by a cartoon in the late 90s was unheard of, and the American censors had to do something about it. You know, for the children, I guess. The other Sailor Scouts thrived in their storylines having love interests of the opposite gender frequently on the show. Not shockingly, Amara's was left out of the plot entirely. The English version covered up the Scouts' sexual and romantic attraction for Amara with desire to be quote, best friends and the need for a role model. Ah yes, the old, they're just roommates line. Oldest trick in the repression book. In the original version, Amara opened up the space for dialogue with young queer viewers, especially young queer women. Though English writers tried their best to erase this queerness, changing Amara's storyline or removing it altogether couldn't be done as she embarked on a romantic relationship with Sailor Neptune, Michelle. English writers couldn't do anything about Amara's masculine features or change her gender and appearance without remaking the show entirely. They could, however, alter her lesbian relationship with Michelle. Making one of the worst and weirdest decisions of the Sailor Moon franchise, the writers decided to rewrite Amara and Michelle as cousins. Instead of allowing parents to have the conversation of lesbian characters with their kids, the writers chose a borderline incestuous relationship that wouldn't have an equivalent of weird until Game of Thrones. The plot then centered on Amara and Michelle having been cousins inseparable at birth to explain their intimacy and poked holes in the story confusing viewers even more. I'm not sure who approved that change, but I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that writer's room when it was suggested. Interestingly, Amara and Michelle's relationship was altered differently depending on which country you resided in. In Russia, Amara is left as a man in civilian form to normalize the relationship, but the Albanian dub skipped season 3 and 5 altogether to avoid the relationship. In the Italian and French dubs, they are portrayed as very close best friends. The Mexican and Brazilian dubs kept the relationship as is. The relationships between Michelle and Amara in the various dubs show the social and cultural influence of societies at the time. You can't help but feel a sense of hypocrisy, noticing the stories with the boy-crazy Sailor Scouts, all the while a very obvious lesbian relationship between two Scouts is concealed or erased altogether. Unfortunately, the Sailor Moon queer erasure would not be the last for North American censors, trying to contain the multiverse of anime. Loyal fans might also be familiar with a show called Cardcaptor Sakura, or just Cardcaptors in the English adaptation. Cardcaptor Sakura was based on the manga series of the same name, written and illustrated by Clamp. Interestingly, Clamp is an all-female artist group in Japan which consists of head writer Nanasi Aokawa and three artists Makona, Tsubaki Nekoi, and Satsuki Igarashi. The show, produced by Madhouse, aired a 70-episode run in Japan from April 1998 to March 2000. In 2000, Nelvana Enterprises, a premier Canadian distributor of children's animation, licensed the series for broadcast in North America. The English dub got rid of Sakura from the title and officially aired in the US on the WB Kids lineup from June 2000 to December 2001. 
For the English version, Cardcaptors whittled down the length from 70 to just 39 episodes and featured confusing, heavily altered, and reordered episodes for its young viewers. The reason? The network wanted to draw in a young male demographic after seeing the success Sailor Moon had on the young female population. To appeal to teenage boys, the episodes focusing on Sakura were left out entirely, <laughs> focusing on Lee's arrival episode, Sakura's Rival, which is the eighth episode in the Japanese version. Not surprisingly, the same-sex male couple, Toya and Yukiro, who shared a wholesome romantic storyline in the manga, are scrubbed out entirely in the English dub. Involved anime lovers might have learned on their own time about how censorship changed these couples, but many casual fans never had the opportunity to find out. While the recent redub of Sailor Moon has been straightforward about its romance, Cardcaptor Sakura never got such a gift, and many of the show's other queer characters suffered a similar fate. Not all hope is lost, however. The same social media exposure and accessibility that initially pushed anime into the world stage is now being used to share even more information about the original intent of our favorite shows. Fans on Twitter in particular are taking to the tweets to share just how censored anime has been for us for the last 30 years with regards to queer characters and opening up new stories, characters, and even writing the history for beloved fan favorites. Finally, these characters have the chance to come out of the closet and have exposure to new and old fans alike without worrying about erasure. And that's a beautiful thing. Perhaps in the future, all the popular early 2000s anime will get the reboots that they deserve, just like Sailor Moon with viewer pushback. Only time will tell. Thanks for watching, Tonglers. Remember to like and subscribe for more exclusive Tongle content. And if you're a creator, be sure to visit the Tongle website at tongle.com for some exciting opportunities.